Ladies and gentlemen, I understand that tonight's questions are going to concern reason and emotion and the relationship between these two and the clarification of some of the problems and confusions pertaining to their relationship. All right, let's begin with the first question. Mr. Brandon, why do so many people seem to assume that reason and emotions are antagonists? Well, there are a number of reasons for this that I can think of. To begin with, most people don't have a clear understanding of what reason is or what emotions are. It took many thousands of years before philosophers were even able to arrive at and introduce the concept of that distinction into people's understanding. It was only in classical Greece that for the first time a clear-cut distinction and differentiation between reason and emotion was arrived at. And there are many, many people living today who have never really yet achieved an understanding of what is the difference between reason and emotion or thinking and feeling. There are many reasons why people might assume there is a clash or conflict or dichotomy between the two. One of the obvious factors is that many people do not think about or reflect on their actions or their desires or the meaning of their actions or desires or the practicality or the realism or the justice of the things they do or want and don't care to consider the facts of reality, don't care to consider what is true or false or right or wrong or just or unjust. And if people have the kind of desires and emotional responses and goals and longings that are formed and pursued without any concern for such questions, Obviously, these people are going to believe and experience a conflict between reason and emotion. One of the most frequently encountered explanations when we find a person who subscribes to this dichotomy is simply that he has emotions which he knows perfectly well are not justifiable in terms of reason so that he doesn't want the issue of reason to come up, and or a closely related but perhaps slightly different factor is that of a person not all of whose emotions or desires are necessarily in fact wrong or irrational, but who just the same resents the need to be concerned with whether they are or not, who doesn't care to find out, who doesn't want to have to lead the life of a thinking person. Now, what other explanations might there be? Sometimes it's a misconception of reason. A person equates reason with the acceptance of a particular set of rules or prescriptions or precepts that are largely socially endorsed. Now, these might be utterly irrational. And in contradistinction, his own desires and emotions might have a great deal to commend them and justify them. But he may not know that. And he may feel or believe that there is a conflict which he calls a conflict between reason and emotion, but which can be understood as a conflict between social rules and precepts which people call reasonable and, on the other hand, emotions and desires of his own, which may or may not be valid or justifiable. A person who has a good, clear understanding of what reason and emotions are is not going to subscribe to the belief that they are enemies or antagonists. Reason and emotion have two different functions. 
Reason is the tool and the process by which we apprehend the facts of reality. It's the means by which our mind is able to understand and grasp facts, truths about the world. Emotions pertain to our values, to our value responses to different aspects of the world. Emotions are the form in which we experience our evaluations that something is good for us or bad for us. An emotion as such, of course, is an involuntary process. It's an automatic response, an automatic summation based upon complex integrations of the mind, largely subconscious, by which an individual appraises something as being good for him or bad for him, desirable or undesirable, beneficial or threatening, or whatever the case may be. Each function, the function of reason and the function of emotion, is vitally important. Man needs both for his effective action, for his survival, but they are two different functions. They are not incompatible functions, and ideally, in a person who is well integrated, they will tend largely to be very much in harmony. Yes. Aside from the factors you just named, what are the reasons why some people appear to have great difficulty in distinguishing between a thought and an emotion, or thinking and feeling? Well, I assume that you are now referring to people who theoretically understand the distinction between reason and emotion, but who have difficulty applying it to the contents of their own consciousness. There are several factors that might be pertinent here. To begin with, we have to realize that almost every thought does have some sort of associated emotion. And every emotion, even in cases where the person doesn't really understand its causes or roots, has some sort of ideational material flowing along with it, however fragmentary or incoherent. And very often, there can be a strong thought and a strong emotion happening simultaneously. So, perhaps here we can see why there is some possibility or springboard for the confusion existing in the first place. But beyond that, I would say the following. In order to be relatively effective at knowing how to distinguish between thinking and feeling, a person has to have a policy of thinking generally. In other words, he has to have a policy pursued over some period of time by which he is attempting to understand the world, to grasp facts, to reflect on the things he sees, to make sense out of the world around him or the particular aspect confronting him at some time that he wants to understand. Because if a person has never done any but the minimal amount of thinking imaginable, it's very likely that the contents of his consciousness are going to be such a jumble, he is going to be so non-introspective, so non-aware of himself, that without outside help, he probably will sometimes have tremendous difficulty in knowing how to distinguish between thinking and feeling, simply because he has no clear-cut grasp of what thinking is. He hasn't done enough of it to be able to clearly and unmistakably recognize its internal signs. The extent to which he really has a policy of trying to understand, trying to connect things logically, trying to make some aspect of reality intelligible to himself, he has more or less a reference point, a system by which he can achieve contrast and differentiation between that kind of mental process, trying to understand something, trying to relate something, trying to integrate something, trying to apply the rules of logic to something, with, in contrast, an involuntary feeling response reflecting a usually subconscious evaluation or estimate. If he does not think about the outside world, you may take it as a foregone conclusion that he doesn't think about the inside world either, meaning he doesn't think about his own mind or its contents. And many people are 
abysmally, perhaps I should say pathetically, blind and helpless when it comes to identifying the simplest facts about what goes on inside their own minds. They have little or no capacity for introspection.